Second, the humanities need new institutional and cross-institutional structures in order to accomplish effectively any newly articulated project. Third, and perhaps most importantly, we need to attempt this with a steady eye upon the fact that we all succeed repeatedly in forgetting that our students aren't us, whatever us you might want to invoke, and different in many different ways, all of which we need to take into account. For me, right now, the biggest experience, direct experience I have with that is we're becoming a STEM predominant university. That's the basic fact of my academic experience. Let me begin by articulating the value of cross-institutional collaborations, what to my mind makes them worth doing. One of my first and most recurring experiences as a newly hired assistant professor at the University of Washington was hearing my colleagues complain, often loudly and bitterly, about what high school or transfer students newly arrived on campus didn't know how to do. And implicit in the complaint, should already have learned somewhere else that there are disconnects at almost every juncture across K-12 systems, community college systems, and four-year college university systems is obvious to anyone who's been paying attention to American education, nor is it a problem that seems to have lessened much in recent years. From my perspective in the humanities, these disconnects are seen as a matter of both content and skills. Among the content issues, in high schools, environmental literacy seems to be on a permanent back burner. Issues of race and of cultural identity more broadly remain incredibly hard to discuss. And media literacy is an area where teachers can feel they are perpetually behind their students. Among the skills issues, levels of both writing fluency and reading or viewing sophistication vary enormously, even among a highly selective incoming population of undergraduate students like we have at UW. So I accepted eagerly in 1999 when invited by humanities faculty at Brown to participate in developing a Puget Sound offshoot of their text and teachers program. In the course of building this program, we benefited from enough accidental advantages, institutional possibilities, and sheer tenacity that we remain the only branch of text and teachers still in operation. The UW text and teachers program addresses the disconnects I mentioned by linking in an ongoing way faculty taught university humanities courses with high school classrooms, high school students, and their teachers in order to study shared content and to work on similar analytical and writing skills. It provides for ongoing curricular development and pedagogical collaboration among university humanities departments and high school language arts programs on the principle that meaningful pedagogical change is rarely a matter of singular inventions or intermittent interventions. Instead, the most effective classroom transformations grow out of sustained reflection and interaction among a set of professionals working on shared classroom-specific pedagogical questions and engaging in a collaborative reshaping of their own curricular and educational practices. Two features make text and teachers notably different from other university-sponsored humanities outreach activities. First, it is not a top-down program, but fully collaborative at every stage. It involves high school teachers from the start in helping to design the courses that they will be teaching parallel to the university courses, making them partners in a shared educational project. Second, this program encourages interaction among the college and high school classes. Text and teachers programs typically involve one visit by the high school students to the university campus to participate in the link course, along with a few visits by the university faculty to the high schools to do their classroom teaching there. The benefits of involvement flow in both directions with teachers and students in the different settings sharing their educational experiences and expertise. I'm here with an optimistic report. This sort of ongoing educational transformation can be implemented and can be sustained. Doing so is hard work. So I wanna focus upon some of the big challenges that work against sustainability. But the results as assessed by the UW and the high school dual credit program clearly demonstrate that courses like the ones we teach achieve transformative effects in the professional development of teachers, in curriculum design and implementation and in student outcomes. Although hard to scale up, an issue on which I'll offer some reflections, these dual credit programs strengthen articulation across educational levels in ways that I would argue are hard to replicate without the sustained effort. 
to transformations. For me, the effects of this program upon my teaching have been profound, penetrating into every class I teach. Spending time with high school teachers and their students has sharpened my metacognitive grasp of issues fundamental to teaching, assignment design, methodological self-awareness, reading and writing habits and practices. This benefit seems to me especially crucial for the humanities, a collection of disciplines that have, to my mind, considerably less methodological, methodological clarity and certainty than most other academic disciplines, and that have yet to succeed in conveying to the contemporary public the specificity and value of the sorts of analytical thinking and writing in which we seek all too often, maybe with middling success, to train our students. Moreover, my groups of high school students have been desperate for the sort of professional development, support, and respect that our program can provide. They are the ones who have kept me going. They have helped convince me of how badly high schools desire curricular change in the humanities and real support in implementing it, sometimes against local resistance. But they've also taught me how much practical wisdom they have about teaching cohorts of students that are, in many cases, more diverse in personal, educational, and economic backgrounds than my university students. Annual informal gatherings, usually a couple a year, and intermittent larger workshops every few years have been an essential tool for sharing ideas and sharpening our sense of purpose and method. Crucial as well for bringing new teachers into our conversations. For the high school students, our classes visibly enhance their sense of their own expectations, abilities, and confidence, especially for high school seniors who may have begun to look ahead and to tune out. Tackling college-level work is a new challenge that renews their academic engagement and energizes their teachers. In my class, for instance, students read works that range from the historically distant Robinson Crusoe to an at first, and maybe ultimately in the end, also impenetrable William Faulkner, to Octavia Butler's mind-bending wild scene. Students benefit as well from curricular convergence, working on writing texts that are fully comparable with college-level assignments, carefully scaffolded assignments designed to heighten their grasp of what close reading means and why it is worth doing. Both teacher feedback and UW and the high school surveys confirm that students become more confident about their interpretive participation and writing skills, an impact that carries over into higher rates of success and retention at the university level. Somewhat to my surprise, one of the biggest student effects has come from the back and forth visits. Having a college professor in their class, leading the class as he or she would on their own campus, gives high school students a chance to show themselves that they can participate in high-level discussions about complex literary or cinematic texts. They gain from this an anticipatory sense of the greater pace and intensity of college-level instruction. Likewise, joining a university class, even just for a single day, helps strengthen their sense that they belong in college and that they have the tools to succeed there. Even more powerful is an expanded version of the college field trip day devised by one of my colleagues in this program, an all-day event that brings together all the students from several high schools and from UW as many as 300 at one time, for a day-long series of workshops and group discussions. Three challenges, i.e. problems I mostly solved. One, funding. Surprisingly, funding has turned out to be less of an issue than I fear, although also a never absent concern. Less for continuation than for expansion. Anything worth doing takes some money. And even low-cost programs need reliable sources of funds. For us, the dual credit model housed in our Office of Professional and Continuing Education helps leverage funds for expansion. The great good fortune of having on our campus a robust humanities center with a very supportive director has been invaluable. But sadly, it remains all too clear to me that our university administration and I have here in parentheses like most, I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> There's very little about the existence of any particular program such as ours. It's just not going to be part of their budget mix. Two, staffing. The challenges of getting faculty at Research One University to commit long-term to 
time and energy to the program are immense. My colleagues are my biggest problem in many ways. The professional rewards for doing so are simply too small. It has in practice turned out to be UW lecturers and colleagues at regional liberal arts universities who are most inclined to consider participating in this program. Finding rules for graduate students likewise remains a challenge. Given the extensive obligations they already face, and their relatively short-term potential for involvement. Three, working relationships. A big challenge, though perhaps always also the greatest pleasure, comes from the effort needed to establish long-term working relationships with individual teachers. The commitment has been there from both sides in all of our working groups, but individual and institutional flux demand constant readjustment. The biggest mistake I made at the start of this program People always like to hear about that, right? What did you do wrong? <laughs> Everything might not do. Was imagining that contacting school district offices or even high school principals would be of much use. Real sustainable collaborations need, I think, to be established from the bottom up with individual departments and teachers. Maintaining them as high school teachers move along in their careers is never easy. Replacing teachers we have lost is harder in some ways than finding collaborators in the first place. In addition, trying to extend the pedagogical impact, much less track that, of the program's practices across an entire language arts program, or even deeply into it, is incredibly difficult. That's a price of this model based upon personal relationships that I don't think I've succeeded yet. <coughs> Four, and finally, problems, i.e. the unsolved issues. One, diversity and equity. That last issue links to one that continues to draw my attention. The difficulty of deeply diversifying high school student participation in a program such as ours that enrolls juniors and seniors. Widening the pool in any real sense would require the participants, student participants, be recruited and prepared as freshmen and sophomores. Any single class that does not connect strongly to a department's entire curriculum will have a limited impact at best. One advantage to be sure that we have is that most high school teachers do teach classes at varied level, and our teacher collaborators are thus well positioned to reach out to students earlier, a process that we need continuing effort to make as thoroughgoing as it might be. Finally, to scaling up. Scaling up expands impact, obviously, but also risks diluting whatever features make a program effective in the first place. This is all the more true when that program is based upon long-term working relationships. I think there's a limit not far distant now of how large this program can become at UW with me as its sole director. We've grown slowly, adding forces and building capacity for existing ones at a slow rate, one way in which we husband our not, mostly non-existent financial resources. That's all. Let me just close maybe by thanking the organizers of this conference from which I've already taken a lot, taken away a lot of really good ideas noted down in my notes. Um, you are, those of you here who are organizing this, I think, and hope launching conversations that all of us in the humanity really badly need to have to have lunch. So thank you for that. Um, so, so great. Um, so in your uh, notebook, you, uh, you have Humanities New York is the new name of the organization. That's a product of rebranding and lots of discussions and a lot of fun to put a graphic identity on an organization. Uh, so the New York Council for the Humanities is the older name, but generically we are a state humanities council and we are state and territory in the nation, including Washington, D.C., and Guam, and there's seven, so there's 56 state humanities councils, and they all have the relationship to the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, which in other than Nixon years created uh, state programs. So Nixon took a look at what LBJ created at the NDH, and he said, states, I want this to be in the states, you know. Uh, so humanities councils were created um, somewhat uh, um, against the will of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we uh, still have a sort of interesting relationship with uh, the parent ship uh, to this day. Uh, we're a regular 501c2, and that means that we're a nonprofit constituted to benefit society.
identity or individuals in some way. So in purely in philanthropy, you deal a lot with mission. What is mission? What's your mission statement? You spend a lot of time on this. Uh, people in the humanities have a tangential relationship to that um, in the sense that you know how to think big. You have, uh, you're always trucking with vision, with ideas, with techniques, and that sort of thing. But then you have to kind of structure it to make a mission statement. And you have to do that with other people. And some of them will be board members with very different ideas uh, of what things should be. And the other people involved are staff members who are like, why am I here? And the other sorts of people are your uh, partners out in the field, like who you actually work with and you need to listen to them. Anyway, uh, all that to say uh, that the I will C3 status means that we're not only doing humanities sort of out in the wild, but I would say to you, if I had to give this a title, which I didn't, I didn't even choose, um, you know, I, I've titled some talks like this, uh, ecosystem of the humanities. So where are the humanities out there in the world? Um, and I just wanted to say before that, that you're all here for very good reasons. You're on the right track. If you are A, hoping to reposition the humanities as uh, extremely useful, both in the university setting and in the world, um, you need nuts and bolts things. And I see whatever we give them, you can all write them down. So I'll give you some. But also, you deserve to be inspired, and so that's why I heard about it, the keynote today, that it was very inspired. Um, because you're on the right path, you're doing the right things uh, for the communities and for our society if people just not forget that they have their communities and what they are. So, so what is that ecosystem? And I think if you are in the academy, it might be a little bit difficult to recognize. Uh, you think you've got this, this market cold. Uh, everything is under your control, you're in a teacher sponsored curriculum, etc. But the minute you're not looking out there in the world, it's happening anyway. Uh, it might look like something else. It might look like Book Rose Book Club. People love that. Uh, it might actually look like a poetry jam. That's an amazing form. And it doesn't really connect necessarily to other types of work uh, that the humanities do or each other. And each seems to really dive into a different uh, community or group or fan base, you know, who really loves this stuff. Um, so fan base, that's a whole other, you know, what do people geek out on um, uh, is another aspect. But, but one that has actually been taken up by my organization in a, in a very big way is just the daily act of conversation or dialogue. You know, there were so many articles right before Thanksgiving this year and last year, like, how not to explode at Thanksgiving, how to keep this conversation on the rails, topics to avoid, things like that. Um, and let alone when you actually get to really challenging conversations uh, out there. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that uh, we've really latched upon is a, what you might call a, I don't, I don't want to call it this, but a folk form of, uh, of getting together called the book club or a book discussion. Um, now, we're all too busy to do that in the academy. We can't do that. We can't just have a book club, read for fun. Um, but it's, it is very popular. So one of the program types that we developed that is really a way to put the tools of the humanities into people's hands is in the form of a, we market it as a book discussion club. It isn't though. Um, it's, it's its own special thing and I'll tell you about it. Um, but at any rate, what I want to say is that if you're sort of looking for where the humanities are already going on, you, you have to use hone your observation skills a little bit and be ready to accept humanities practices in the world where they are um, that uh, may or may not look like teaching. Uh, in the corporate world, they call that training. And they call that, you know, I mean, <laughs> they have had to reinvent it. They don't have professors on staff. They don't uh, necessarily hire people even that have a huge amount of humanities expertise or training. So they're going to reinvent it themselves without your help. And it's you know, global competencies. And it's things that people that are very good with languages and writing uh, do that second nature, but that they're going to reinvent. Um, so we look for that kind of thing and sort of see where a little bit of money, a little bit of resources, and some good partnerships could push uh, a practice that maybe is already existing that we don't have to totally reinvent or spend a huge, huge ton of money on, but that we can push uh, something and cause it to be better sustained, better designed, have better content, and, and better results. 
So uh, that's one aspect of, of the, uh, how we sort of look at the world and how we move around. Um, and uh, I know that a lot of what uh, your organizers are worried about and yourselves are how you raise the profile of humanities in the university. And I think that work, the, the sort of crossing disciplines and making sure that there's humanities teaching in different majors and that requirements are kept and all of that, it's actually much harder work than what I'm talking about in the public humanities or even applied humanities that is, uh, is already going on. So latching into the community in some ways might be a bridge back into the university and through service learning, which our colleagues can speak about next. Uh, when you have these vital connections with institutions or with audiences outside of your campus, whether this is a reading group at a local library or it's a partnership with a historical society or it's an app or signage, these things have, are vital connections that train everybody from the teachers to the students to the grad students who are working on them and infuse that work uh, back into the university. So we had done a lot of work in the public and our grants had not had uh, very much to do with the academy. We consider universities very, very well funded. Um, and so our small grants, let's say $5,000 or $10,000, isn't necessarily going to go straight to the university. But uh, what we find is that um, it's, it's an extremely important institution in many cities. So New York State is huge, right? Uh, we have Buffalo on the other end of the state and New York City where I live and where our office is based. Um, and then you have Rochester. What's going on in Rochester? Well, who's the biggest employer is the university today. It's the university and the medical centers um, now that most of the sort of Kodak and um, uh, other technologies have, have left. Um, what's left is the university. So you, you find universities also being kind of morally pulled into the community fabric by dint of their resources and by dint of having this huge employer base. Um, and there's, there's reasons besides just the typical town of gown divide that you kind of want to overcome, ideally, um, but because they're being called upon as an economic player to, to do something. So we've worked more with universities. I started there in 2002 as a grants officer, meaning, you know, help people get grants from us. Um, and go give workshops and meet everybody all around the state. Um, after becoming the executive director, I realized that I have these sort of cross credentials, so a PhD. Now everybody in my job has a PhD. Some are former athletes and uh, news anchors and all kinds of things all around the uh, states, but there are a handful of, um, used to be a lot more PhDs, they're sort of retiring the original crowd in the 70s to now. Um, but then you have uh, sort of mid-career people like me, I'll be 50 this year, um, and uh, quite a handful of us have PhDs in different, in different disciplines. So we could think a little bit creatively about how to partner back with the university in a way that wouldn't change our DNA completely and also would have cost us so much money because really programs here are expensive and we don't have that kind of funding. Uh, so uh, one thing that we did do, and that I won't talk about too long, but that you might want to check out as a resource, is to run a public humanities fellowship where we have nine different New York State research institutions with humanities centers involved in CHCI, the Consortium of Humanities Centers and Institutes. Uh, they each choose to um, send us two students a year who get a fellowship. It's modest and it's meant to fit in with ABB type work. Um, it's $8,000 and um, sort of a mix of private and public universities, including CUNY and all the SUNYs, and, um, but then private ones like Syracuse University, and Universidad Cornell, Columbia, and NYU. So they, uh, students apply with a project. The project is going to be something out uh, of the academy that they are going to work on. One example would be uh, a student who decided to reinterpret, uh, do a historical reinterpretation of space in Kingston. This is a town rare enough in New York State that doesn't have a university or college anywhere near it. Um, and she uh, wanted to reinterpret this uh, bakery that had been left by the owners and left exactly the way it was, including a Sunday list of who the customers 
customers were who had come from church to this Jewish bakery and get the rolls, famous Carrera rolls. So uh, she started studying this list and using, she's a history student, using historical research as a way to pull families back together and reconnect them with the space and to help create the interpretation of the space that she brought all these food glazed people, like chefs and things like that, who would eventually be able to recreate this role. And so somebody who had not had it for many decades might try it in a few years from now and say, that's it, that's the one. Or you almost got it. So it's okay. <laughs> but it would be um, a really amazing experience for everyone. Um, the reading groups that we run, the reading and discussion groups uh, that I mentioned, riff on book discussion group are uh, a real exercise in design thinking and how to engage people on the ground in, in group uh, challenging conversations. For example, our James Baldwin in American Book Group is uh, a way to be talking about race and police in five minutes flat in a non-acrimonious way. I'm not going to call it a safe space because it's not actually um, it has, uh, depending on the facilitator, some ground rules or not. That's a style of the facilitator. Facilitator is not somebody we chose and sent. It's not us. It's not one of our staff members or board members. It's somebody that the organization wants to run this, chose themselves. And then they come to us and we do a training, um, teach them facilitation skills, which is, we call it not teaching, and it's not. One of the ground rules or rules, uh, implicit rules, is that you can bring your personal experience into the conversation um, so that uh, it's personal, actually. And uh, I, did, I did a lot of like language pedagogy, um, teaching German, and learning how to do that. So to me, it seems kind of normal. But I think for a history professor, this is shocking to do a facilitation where you may be relatively quiet. You're not uh, giving a lecture, you're not giving a course, but rather reading the group at all times and uh, helping as much as possible for that group to gel, not so that they're all thinking the same, they don't have to be in on when you're done, but uh, so that they trust each other enough to say things, and to say things that are a little braver or go farther than they might have. And in a non-academic setting, uh, you know, people gather the courage to speak to a group of their peers. They're, they're actually exercising leadership, and they don't think of it that way, but gradually some leaders in a group do emerge. And it can be a really great technique for working with a locality or a region to, or a population, let's say, uh, Puerto Rican migrants in Jamestown, New York, who knew that a town of 4,000 was about doubled in size. Um, and that was before Hurricane Maria in a Puerto Rican population. So how do you reach them? They have high poverty rates. Um, they have large families. What, what do you know about them? How can we um, draw them into conversation and find out who is uh, who is well regarded and who have, can exert some influence on others to come and join and do things and uh, no longer be underbanked, for example. So it's a great program I learned in James Tender. Um, so the format of these book groups is, I think, what, what excites me personally on a geek level, is that they, they do resemble in many ways a graduate seminar. Um, well, we don't say that to the people coming to the library to do it, right? say this is, this is James Baldwin or this is Audrey Lord or this is the history of the Erie Canal. And when we started with things that we thought were just historical, just historical. They ended up being a referendum on the future of Buffalo or the branding of the place or you know people in these groups came up with uh, really great ideas and could relax a little bit and decide that Bass Pro is not the only thing it's the state of Buffalo. Other things because we could save them. <laughs> Um, we being the participants. So um, I promised a little bit of nuts and bolts help, and um, I'm going to run off a few things. So if there were a reading list for what I do, Praxis Humanities in the Public, I would say if there's a couple things you could really whole books, only a few. Um, the DNA of our movement, if you will, uh, could be summed up by Danielle Allen's uh, Our Declaration, if you've read it. Um, and her sense of how public humanities is also an act of um, inclusion and building communities up as opposed to tearing them down. And I think that's very important because the, the sort of sense of social equity and 
where nonprofits are in that space and where communities are in that space have a strong overlap that is only just beginning to be explored um, in programs like the ones I mentioned, but uh, community by community. And I think it's, it's a really interesting time for it. Uh, another one, a little more academic, is Martha Nussbaum's Not For Profit. And I think what's nice about that is the way um, it describes the nonprofit space and what philanthropy is and what values are. It's a little less, it's not, not simple, it's enough for me. I don't know really have, but I think if you're in the academy and thinking about this work, uh, that's, that's a really good place to start. Um, I was talking with our colleagues here a bit about Imagining America. UCLA is not currently a member, but maybe you all uh, could be the, the, the uh, organization that, that the department that makes the handshake. Um, and interestingly enough, for, for those of you in languages, uh, the MLA convention uh, starting this year, and I think next year will even be more so under uh, Paula Krebs, who used to be a board member of the State Communities Council. I'll just put that out there. When she was in Rhode Island, uh, they will have a track for um, public and engaged humanities uh, more increasingly over the years. So this year, they already had almost every session had some track that was sort of engaged or applied humanities. And next year, I think it'll be even more robust. And uh, yeah, I'll wrap it there. Thank you so much for having me. Really <laughs>
um, and their sense of how what they're learning in class applies in community context and how there's knowledge generated not just on campus. Knowledge is made in the community and they can go and learn from experts in those fields and bring that knowledge back to enrich their classroom experience. Um, it's beneficial to faculty because I think it can really invigorate your, your process of working with your students. I find that my students are often really, really engaged in the ways, same as they are with other forms of active learning um, with this type of pedagogy. Um, but you're also part of the public mission of higher education when you teach in this way in a very intentional and concrete and clear way that may be implicit in other forms of teaching, but is, is very explicit in this form of teaching. Um, and for our partners, not only do they get to, to sort of build the capacity of their organization and sometimes be, have, have students coming in and doing work that, that they need done and that, they, that they've identified as, as a goal area for them for that quarter that you're working with them, um, but they also get to be real co-educators. And for many of our nonprofit partners, that's almost much more attractive than this. The students who are going to stop cutting work for me for 10 weeks and then leave, sometimes that's not even worth their time to train them. Um, but the idea that maybe what would make it worth my time to invest in, in helping your students learn is that I do get to introduce them to the great cultural wealth of my organization, to our expertise. I get to inspire them. Some of them may want to pursue a career in nonprofit work because they've met me and they understand the expertise that's valuable here. Um, so it's, it's sometimes when we can really create these partnerships where our nonprofits and the schools and the other types of organizations that we're working with um, can see themselves as true co-educators that um, that we value their expertise and, and what they, they're bringing to this partnership, um, that's what everybody's really going to win. Um, uh, there are obviously some challenges to, to this type of teaching as well for our students and our partners. I mentioned the, the short time constraint being uh, difficult for organizations, difficult for students. Um, there's some other constraints I'll mention that I'm happy to talk about more. You can feel free to raise other challenges for us in the Q&A. Um, for students, their time constraints are often and quite severe. You know, many of our students are working, they're parenting, they have family, other kinds of family obligations. So finding the time in their schedule to commit to community work can be hard for them, um, which is why when we're developing service learning courses here at UCLA, we really try to make sure that those community learning hours are factored into the out-of-class load for the course. So we reduce the homework load in other areas to make space in their schedule for the three hours or however many hours per week we expect them to be in the community. Um, there are also significant financial costs potentially to students. Um, the cost of getting to and from an organization, the cost of maybe having to adjust their work schedule to be able to do this. Um, so when possible, we try to reduce other costs in the courses. So um, one of my courses is a course on children's literature and childhood literacy. If any of you have children, you know that children's books are really expensive. Um, so it's impossible for me to reduce the book cost completely in that class, but I try to reduce it as much as I can, which means introducing my students to free online editions of books that they might be reading, giving them the option to purchase the book in the format that's good for them, introducing them to the public library system, which has a very robust circulating collection of children's books that they can freely access. Um, but it's also about making that an issue in the class that we discuss. Why are children's books so darn expensive? Who else are they really expensive for? All these families who want to give their kids access to books. So making that part of the conversation about structural inequality in society, um, thinking about the other sorts of, of issues that might make students feel like this kind of learning isn't isn't accessible to them, and then trying to build into the course um, new way, new access points, things like. Um, making sure that there are a range of time options available to students to choose from, things that will fit their schedules as much as possible, um, offering courses as regularly as we can throughout the quarter. So if this isn't the quarter that works for you, you can access the course at a different time. Um, so now that some of those logistics are kind of out of the way, I'll give you some examples from, from real courses because maybe that will help make this a little more concrete for you. Um, and specifically of how community-engaged research, not just sort of forms of direct service, can be really valuable for both our students and our community partners. Um, sometimes when people hear service learning, they think of, or they hear service, they think of, of direct service as the only type of service that they're really familiar with. Like, I'm gonna go tutor and mentor a child, I'm gonna go hang out with an old person and be a companion for that. And those are all really valuable and they can be part of a service learning course. And, and in my children's lit course, um, the students do spend 20 hours interviewing with children in community spaces, um, but we also do research projects. And whenever possible, try and make sure those research projects have a possibility of being valuable to the community partners that we work with too. Um, so the students in my children's literature course, 
They have four options for their final project for the class. They can write a traditional research paper. They can also write, uh, design a curriculum for a particular age group and then include a research-based rationale for those design choices. They can design a library catalog or they can design a children's book of their own. Um, I've taught this course, this is my fifth quarter teaching it, the four previous quarters, I think I've received three traditional research papers. Um, the students almost always choose these other options. They're more fun. They sometimes think they're going to be easier. They are not easier. They are often at least as hard or harder, um, but they are meaningful to the students in a way that a traditional, like one more research paper about something is not meaningful to them. Designing a, a curriculum for the students that they're working with or for a population that they care about. This is what would have made a difference to me in my school and growing up and no one made this type of learning available to me and I'm going to imagine it. Or I never read children's books with characters in them that look like me growing up. I'm going to go find those books. I'm going to make a list of them and I'm going to give them to this organization as a way to potentially expand their library. Those are the types of projects that make meaning for my students, but that also allow them to share something with partners like the library catalog that when they have a funder who says, here's a grant, you can have some books, they don't just pick a bunch of random books just because they're classics of you know, children's literature that are actually not at all like responsive to the community that the nonprofit organization serves. It gives them a chance to do, to do more with the resources that they're trying to leverage. Um, when, and I think why for us as instructors creating projects like this is really important, is that when students are able to see that the graded assignments for their class are things that are, are valuable to the community, it's not just something extra to the curriculum that you do on your own and then you get graded on a bunch of regular traditional midterms and final papers, they know that, that that's not the currency of academia that matters. They, but if we show them that we care and we've got making this part of their graded curriculum, they understand that. Um, I know we're almost probably one of the questions, but I'll give you a couple quick examples from the a course I taught in the fall. Um, so what some of this teaching experience led me to start thinking about was how could I be even more intentional in designing courses that were more research intensive for my students potentially, so at a higher level in the curriculum, um, but also with the potential for those research projects to be even more likely to benefit the partners that we're working with. So in the case of the children's literature course, the students still get to choose any of those options, they may or may not respond to the organizations that we're working with. I started being more intentional in that course and went to the partners in advance and said, what are the issues you think are most important about children's literacy and children's literature today? Tell me what you wish you either could know more about or what you think people coming into this field need to know about. And I would write up everything that they gave me and give it to my students and encourage them to design projects in line with those goals. But they still had the, the freedom to choose whatever they wanted. That was valuable to the class pedagogically in some ways but then meant that some of the projects were not so valuable to my partners. Um, so trying to think about how could I design something where the partners were even more full participants along with my, me and my students. Um, and that's what I tried to do this past fall. And of course, I community engaged research writing with nonprofit organizations. Um, so what we did, and this one, I'm going to turn it again. Okay. Um, I'm talking to the last week, well, because that might be not going to have time. <laughs> um, I am told that that happens. Uh, <laughs> um, for this course, what I did was work with the partners over the summer in advance to think about what would, um, sorry, I can't talk in type at the same time, it's actually, that's not how I spell my own name. This is what happened. I always tell my students it's actually much harder to write on the board and talk to you. That is how I spell my name. There we go. Okay. Um, So what I did with this course was I worked with partners over the summer to say, if you could imagine a team of students working on a research project for you for 10 weeks, what do you think we could do together? Um, and so some of these partners have been partners with my other courses and I usually plug my students into direct service tutoring with the youth that they work with. Um, sometimes doing back end things like um, back end research to support their development um, prospects or things like that, but never kind of sustained research projects as the service work for the course. Um, so I asked the, my partners, would this be valuable? They're like, yes, we would love to do this. Not all organizations would have said yes, 
They might not have said yes to me if we hadn't built a relationship. They might have said, yes, but not now. It's too much work for me and my staff right now. Um, so there are lots of things to think about when approaching organizations, but do you want to partner on this? Um, but we came up with several ideas about what students might be able to work on. Um, and so students designed, some of them worked on grant research. So for the, the entire quarter, they learned um, from the development team of the organization about how they research potential funders that they could apply to that they research potential funders. They also used our library's resources to look for research that supported the impacts that the organization was making in the community that they could then cite in their reports. So some of this was about opening up UCLA's library resources to some of our partners. And they created this interactive spreadsheet that the organization could search through in different capacities and identify potential funders they could go after. Um, some of them designed curriculum and um, and teaching tools that, that organizations could, could use in English language learning workshops on the weekend, like lesson plans. Um, one of these um, designed sort of activities that were more culturally responsive to the student population that the organization was working with. Um, so this resource bank is for an organization based in Koreatown that serves primarily Spanish-speaking um, immigrants, mostly recent arrivals, middle and high school students who recently arrived from Central and South America, Mexico. Um, and the students designed projects that were, in some cases, uh, bilingual, like worksheets that they could use. Um, here's writing a monologue in the um, in Spanish. I don't read Spanish, so we're going to have to look at this. <laughs> Um, but writing a monologue from a famous person that the student cared about to try and really think about how you would design um, lessons that might be really engaging for the student that you're working with. Um, the students in this group, this is the spreadsheet. This group designed a digital story map to map one of our nonprofit organization partners. Um, they produce an anthology of high school student writing every year. They've been doing this, there's 14 anthologies out now, and they chronicle their successes on their website um, in a blog series of blog posts every year, but they had no way to map, bring all of those stories of every year together, so this map is that story. Um, you can click on any high school and find out what they've been working on, and then click out. All of this came from data and photos and information the organization had, but had never organized into a story. Um, and here you can see the story of this particular book. The students sort of adopted this text from, from an existing sort of source material from the organization, their photo archive. Um, but this entire map is sort of um, built on a free platform. They could hand off to the organization. Their project at the end included a guide for how the organization would continue this project going forward. Um, so some of the examples of things that, that students can do within the space of 10 weeks of working together with an organization and with a faculty mentor. Um, I'm gonna wrap up because we probably want to do the Q&A. Um, but I, so I didn't show you any of the assignments themselves. In order to get something like this done, um, this is where Miriam's examples from digital communities projects are, are just as relevant. Um, there were things like an asset mapping exercise for the team, a team charter with their values and how they're going to communicate with each other and what their goals were, group work plans that they revised throughout the quarter, a rubric for how I was going to grade this thing that they wrote together, as well as things they submitted alone, reflecting and, and connecting research to that project. So I can talk more about that. necessity of the humanities in STEM and getting more promotion of it. How do you see that translating or is it lip service? Um, I can speak a little bit here at UCLA. We've heard that from the guy more close to 
closer. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna eat this microphone for you all. Um, we have developed some um, writing courses and service learning that are medical humanities focused, which are really popular for med students. Um, and I think that there's an interest in developing more uh, medical humanities, environmental humanities courses, which have been great kind of crossovers for those students, um, led by mostly um, humanities faculty. Um, so there's, there is some crossover there, um, and students, I think, um, appreciate having courses that are sort of relevant to their coming out of the field, but maybe just thinking it maybe supports the kind of seats and disciplines that they're interested in, but gives them a new way to approach that. Um, I don't think we're offering anything like that yet at scale at UCLA, um, even the large number of STEM majors that we have, and this relatively small number of students who are taking advantage of small learning seminars, it's not a problem with the STEM budget yet, but my experience at the University is the works without the mic. Yes. Okay. Um, at the University of Washington, my sense is that for the course that I teach, which is an environmental humanities course, in some ways the most receptive audience for that are the natural science people I've gotten to know across the years. A lot of them. And I started on the particular issue of climate change. There's nobody more frustrated than atmospheric scientists about the inability of what they do to make its way into public consciousness in this country, right? I mean, I think there are real connections there that make possible, um, for instance, this, we just implemented a new environmental humanities minor. Okay, major is going to part the best probably, but the biggest supporters of that, in fact, were the College of the Environment. They thought it was a great idea. They have been very interested in hiring graduate students from uh, the humanities field to teach writing-oriented courses to the majors in their program on the environment. Um, so I think there are lots of there's lots of support out there for those kinds of things. Turning the courses into a curriculum is a hard thing to do, and I wanted to say this, but I'll say it anyway. I, you know, I don't think you get there without, in some sense, dismantling the disciplines that we have in place. I don't think you get far enough down the road to actually changing the institution without doing some degree of that, at least in an institution as poor as the Blue Book Bridge. But um, uh, the dead of our College of Arts and Sciences is that. Um, you know, I think you need to actually take some things apart if you're going to build really substantial new stuff, um, which is. I love, I thought you were doing here actually. Um, I went on the website. Okay, what are the groups that you're working with? Environmental humanities, brilliant idea. Um, medical humanities, likewise, brilliant idea. Digital humanities, brilliant idea. And, but to turn this, this into a curriculum is a big step, right? I also like one that is the of humanities that I think is also really great work. Yeah, I see, I see receptivity as well. Especially in those audience service, uh, you know, med schools are getting a little better, but they had been a naturally occurring vacuum of humanities for the U. Um, so I think uh, med schools too are actually turning that kind of thing to their test. And the application process for pre med is actually, they, used to, they still require them to have a certain number of English courses, but have never been very intentional about why and why we why do it to like this. And so the pre med students don't understand why they're being made to do this, but the theoretical men will know because we need to be able to communicate with people who are different from you. And we do need to make these courses that help you do that. Um, but that's where we've been most successful trying to work within the structures that we have, given the limited kind of space, we can even insert some of these kinds of programs within things like the writing requirements that students have to take anyway to graduate and give them a sort of medical humanities focus. Then they're more prepared to have things to write about in their application. They have real experiences with real people and not just sort of, I delivered some jello while someone else delivered a baby. I really want to be a doctor. Please let me into med school. Um, which is, uh, students often think all they have to do is talk about hours in the hospital, and it's really not going to make them a better medical professional. It's not going to show them the range of options that, that are out there for health related careers. And <laughs> I think this one can be addressed to all three. Uh, this is about how to select 
uh, and vet community partners. You're going to select the type you. Uh, <laughs> or that. <laughs> but, uh, but it's true. Uh, the community partnerships are tricky, and a lot of it is institutional culture. And, um, and nothing beats a site visit and a meeting in the Don't meet here, meet there. And our office is like this. Like, everyone's hysterical and panicked because they don't have their understaffing. They don't have one second. They, may, they may not really have a window there. But if you have thoughtful uh, people who seem, who seem to have a bit of um, authority over the kinds of projects that they choose, then you do make it really fun. But I, I would also say you take very seriously the mission statement of the organization that you have in your group in mind may or may not uh, fit with that mission. So the closer it already is to what's on paper, the better. <laughs> um, because everything else may, may actually be a stretch and, and may for certain organizations put their forward in danger at certain ways. So um, you want to try to be supportive of that would that be a first step. I think absolutely go go in there, meet them in their space, show that you value their time and their community, and then shut up and listen first about what are they looking for. What are they working on? How do they already work with college students? Because they probably might actually already work with a lot of college students. You just don't know that. And, and so what's worked for them? What doesn't work for them? Um, listening to them before you come in with your project idea. Um, and then allowing the project to evolve out of what is valuable to the organization and feasible for them and their staff. Um, we're often kind of used to thinking about the academy as this kind of establishment of knowledge, like we're, we're all really, really smart and we have great ideas and we are smart and we do have great ideas, but so do all these people in this community. Um, and so valuing their their expertise in that way is a really important. Um, but you're right, if it doesn't, if, if they're too busy to accommodate students in their space, then recognize what are your goals for your students learning and does this organization look like it could connect with that, or maybe it doesn't. Not all organizations are the right fit for the right for the same teach class, but that's not the one. And you know, you've built those relationships that you've repeated over the years. Yeah. 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 I mean, in a certain sense, it started out random. I can only think of one bad experience in 20 years. Um, and again, I think it's because you're going to people and saying, we, we would like you to participate in this project or curriculum design that you're going to help shape according to the students that you're teaching, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that gets you buy-in and thinks in a very good way. Uh, beyond that, I agree with both of them. Go there, go there, it makes a huge difference. Oh, and the teachers love swag, like any kind of nonprofit handbag or tote bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, non and, and nonprofits always need money, so if you have an opportunity and you can just, I don't know, package it into a grant, just mm -hmm. call it that. It's in-kind services, but um, it has value. Your time as a professor is worth at least a hundred dollars an hour. So, so something like that, like you're, you, you can give it and say that they actually want to use it, as opposed to I, I bring you my knowledge. I'm here for you to get you your development. You get a bunch of people for you to train on your aunt for the free time. <laughs> <laughs> but those things, those things are always a trade. You do have things you might not know what they are. You can train them for it. I can probably just put back. I have a question that I was probably direct to Dr. Hamburg, but I'm sure you guys have an answer. Um, he described for us a very interesting collaboration between the University of Kentucky and K or high school teachers um, down the level of course design and instructional practice. Have you made any headway in um, maybe sort of reshaping institutional norms about what counts as quality scholarship? to incentivize your university faculty to participate. Put differently, why isn't this just like a waste of my time? We know that it's not, we see value in it, but, but it's a hard work to want to take. You know, this is my school, and um, I was just at a panel down in the College of the Environment, where they were talking about public engagement of scientists, right? Um, and you know, one of the speakers there who's doing this amazing geology outreach program in Africa, um, and somebody asked him this question, and he said, it's a labor of love. You know, you sort of have to find somebody who really sort of wants to do this. Um, you know, PhD students who 
it's partly his fault too, for instance, that are kind of interested in even doing it. Um, at my school, it's a really hard sell. It's a really hard sell. Um, have I made progress? Um, no. Not in changing my institutional norms and matter. Actually, in any number of areas, not when I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think many institutions, I mean, the University of Washington is very similar to the institutions in terms of its research. Based identity, its tenure and promotion systems are quite like they're not even actually all that narrow in how they define themselves as, as research. They're just perpetuating norms and things that are narrow with in how those those are enacted. Like like I don't know what the senior grad would say, but something along the lines of like you know great expertise in your discipline, and then they let the discipline define what the norms are, but they've been fairly narrowly defined. What we're looking for. So you're going to publish a monograph, and then you'll get tenure. You're going to teach the things that people tell you to do for your department, not new innovative things until maybe after you have tenure, or maybe with this small senior seminar, you do something cool, but not in this other area of your curriculum. Um, we were talking at lunch about how the tenure and promotion guidelines um, were really, as we and the larger sort of systems of their product were more structured to the economy, would need to really value this type of work. At all the different levels to encourage people who we need to value teaching more first, and we don't do that yet. <laughs> we need to also value this type of teaching, we need to value this type of scholarship. Um, so that's where I've had done a lot of research about, about what that could look like. And there are some institutions that have made those changes to their, their larger structures, created public scholarship criteria for what that looks like as a form of expertise, just like creative work, just like other forms of research and scholarship. But most universities haven't. Um, and as a result, our graduate programs too tend to just reproduce. We're going to talk about this on the next panel, but they tend to reproduce the academy at the way that it has been for many, many decades instead of, of imagining what the academy should look like for the 21st century students that we're actually at this point. Let me just, this had just occurred to me, and I'm not sure I ever had a thought quite this way before that, in a sense, I think the big barriers are not even so much institutional culture except. But psych psychology, I mean, the way that, in fact, university faculty, say, at a research one university, have internalized, not at all bad, loyalties to their departments, loyalties to their the fields that they work in, right? I mean, those are psychologists who deeply have loyalties, right? And most of them are already doing three or four or five things, right? Um, which, again, is why I'm saying, let's dismantle something and you know, take a pick, right? And, you know, some of that. Well, that's nice. I mean, our undergraduate students, I mean, part of why the STEM majors aren't doing as much as they because their curriculum is so regimented and systems that like, there's no room for them to do anything until we make space, when we take, break it apart and make some new space. And then, yeah, we actually think that you will benefit from this. Your everything will benefit. Your sort of sense of your critical thinking skills, your sense of yourself as a human being by the time you graduate, your employability, if that's what you care about, the more than the major, right? They need more than just content now, like memorize the masters, which is in the 21st century, but our structures aren't really as flexible as they need to be to live up to the Especially sustainable, yeah. which we get going, right? Quarter after quarter, which is actually, especially with some of the engagement side, what you would all need, right? Like, you don't want me to stop by one quarter, do a really great thing, and then never come back <laughs> again, or not come back until, again until next fall. Like, that's almost just as bad. And that, like, the organization. So a big part of what like I try to do at, at my center is I can't teach my course my same course every single quarter and do my job and I have to do my faculty and my work, but, but can't we design some structures that for students and faculty there's a system where we're rotating some students with others that set of students we're building curriculum that people can adapt and, and teach for their purposes but that that provides some level of sustainability given all the many things that have to change like who's doing what and which students are in the room and a lot of things just can't be Instructors as institutions. Um, well, I like any panels on the program.